In this last video on queuing systems in healthcare, I wanted to highlight something a little different, that of patient classification techniques and how they can be highly useful on their own or combined with previous methods we have explored. Firstly, for prediction. Imagine a patient had just been admitted to critical care. It would be useful to know the probability of survival or death, say, as well as the length of stay in the unit. Such predictions are helpful on their own, but also useful for planning and managing capacities such as the number of beds needed in critical care. As further medical observations are made on the patient, so of course we can update any predictions. If we know that a patient is likely to leave the unit tomorrow, then that, for example, would be useful knowledge for planning elective surgery tomorrow where a critical care bed is needed postoperatively. Actually, here is an example of critical care data using classification and regression trees, CART, where we're trying to predict length of stay in the critical care unit. Node 0 contains all the data, 1,768 observations, with an average length of stay of 4.8 days, and the corresponding distribution is shown here. CART uses a binary split-in technique to try and reduce overall variance. More generally, CART is one of the decision tree family of tools. It shows here that the most important split to predict length of stay initially is whether the patient is emergency or elective. If you're emergency, on average, you're more likely to be in the unit for 5.1 days, whereas elective on average only 3.3. So if you only had one question to ask an incoming patient to try and predict length of stay, it's best to ask whether they are emergency or elective. But of course we can do better and CART refines its predictions by going to another level of the branch on the tree. This time it selects an Apache score, which actually is a measure of severity of the patient. So for example, we have found a node here, node 5, which only has an average length of stay on average around 2 days and 309 patients, and that has a very different distribution, much shorter than node 0 overall. And in fact we can also calculate the reduction in variance of the whole tree, or RIV, which tells us, in essence, how much more information we have squeezed out of the data than just treating all patients from, from node zero. Without wishing to go into detail, in fact, we would need to sample from all our data a training set to build the cart tree and then test on a remaining testing data set. This is a good practice indeed for whatever statistical model you are building. Here are some other approaches to classification which are more broadly fall under data mining tools. This is by no means an exhaustive list. I have previously compared several of the techniques for their predictive power, but also their interpretability for use in clinical settings. One reason why I'm a particularly big fan of decision trees is that they have been shown to be good predictors, but also very easy for uh, people to understand, particularly in healthcare and medical settings, unlike, say, neural networks, which are rather black box. As well as prediction, classification tools can be useful for compartmentalising your patient groups and feeding into other models, such as Markov chains, queuing models and simulations. By compartmentalising, I mean that we can, if we can better cluster patients into more homogeneous groups, such that people with a group exhibit similar features, for instance similar outcomes, similar service times, demand profiles or resource consumption. This diagram illustrates the concept of interfacing classifiers and models, such that we end up with a set of patient groups in the model, each with different distributions to sample from. Briefly, here is an example I worked on concerning diabetic retinopathy with a Wellcome Trust study and collaborators in India. CART is used to produce a tree to predict the overall probability of onset of diabetic retinopathy, which leads to blindness. And for example, from an overall 10% chance of developing retinopathy, we have found some groups with as much as 80% chance of developing the condition. In fact, there are seven terminal nodes in the tree, final risk predicting groups, which form seven different risk groups that are fed into the model, which is used to actually model patients' pathway through the disease state. Furthermore, a distinct advantage of having a rule-based classification tree is that we can model scenarios in which we reduce overall variance or overall risk of developing retinopathy. So, for example, by moving individuals between groups to reduce their risk by making lifestyle changes and then feeding those new groups into the model. 
Finally, I'd like to mention Coxian phase type modelling, which neatly brings together the Markov type structures we have explored and patient classification. A Coxian phase type distribution has a structure, structure shown here, which is essentially that all data is fed into the first phase of a Markov chain structure and then can pass through various phases or move to the absorbing state. Each phase in, of dwelling time in the distribution is an exponential distribution. If, for example, we're fitting this to length of stay, the shorter length of stays would drop out much quicker, whereas people staying a long time would move through multiple phases before dropping out of the system. The actual best number of phases required to fit the distribution can be determined. Here's an example of phase type fitted distribution to some ambulance data from Wales. We're trying to fit a distribution to the total time an ambulance is busy on call. With one phase, as shown here, the pore is fit as it's just an exponential distribution and has nothing like the distribution we, we actually observe in practice. We can measure the goodness of fit using the BIC score here as one example, Bayesian information criteria. We aim to minimise the BIC score. BIC combines goodness of fit whilst penalising overfitting. So as we increase the number of phases in our model, we start to see how a distribution produces a better fit to the data. In fact, we can show that with 14 phases, this minimises the BIC score. Actually, other research we have done, though, has indicated that four phases is sufficient when we've been looking at different types of ambulance vehicles, and that each phase could actually have an interpretation as being one of four phases of the ambulance journey. That is, travel to the patient, the time spent on scene with the patient, travel to hospital, and the turnaround time at the interface between the ambulance service and the emergency department. In fact, it's really nice if the number of phases does have an analogous representation to the real-life system, although it isn't necessary. I took this diagram from a very nice paper by Mark Fackrell. It shows how data from residential and nursing homes can be captured with a two-phase model. Broadly speaking, those of a short length of stay and those of long stays. This is a useful classifier and the states can then be used in the Markov chain model as shown to model the flow of elderly patients in the care system and examine resource needs. And last but not least, one can start to build discrete conditional phase type models, again by interfacing the conditional component, that is to classify, again from the range of techniques listed earlier, and depending on the outcome, patients are directed into the corresponding process component, which here is fitted to each stream by phase type model. We use this structure, for example, to model risks to women at birth by predicting those mothers at a higher risk of complicated births and then fitting a duration of delivery to each separate risk group to allow us to capture such things as the overall number of beds and midwives needed on the unit. Well, that's all from me. I hope at least you got something from one of the four videos and that you can see applying OR methods and modelling queuing systems in healthcare is a fascinating research topic whilst recognising that many healthcare processes are stochastic and therefore require stochastic methods and classification tools to assist. There's plenty of opportunity to apply your research in this field to help solve real-world problems and improve the healthcare system.